good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone in the room and online to our Eccles Alumni Forum. My name is Stephanie Cooley. I sit on the Alumni Outreach Committee of the David Eccles Alumni Network Board, which plans and hosts the Eccles Alumni Forums. The Eccles Alumni Forums are an opportunity to gather with our great alumni to learn more about emerging industry trends, pressing community needs, and how we can all excel and grow in our own careers. We are so excited to share an intriguing panel discussion with you today on the 2024 Economic and Market Outlook. Did you know about 2 billion people in 50 countries will go to the polls this year? The leadership shakeup will impact the global economy and market. And we are so excited to have two national experts to speak on this today. I am Mark Davis. I also sit on the Alumni Outreach Committee of the David Eccles Alumni Network Board. Before we turn the time over to Young Yu Ma and Adam Looney, I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsor, BMO Wealth Management, and welcome Michael Poulter, Managing Director of the BMO Salt Lake City offices to say a few words. Thank you, Mark. So my name is Mike Poulter. I'm the Managing Director for BMO Wealth Management in Utah. Um, we're, uh, we're pleased and very proud to uh, partner with the uh, David Eccles School of Business as one of the primary sponsors this year. It was a great opportunity for us. We appreciate the invitation. Um, we're even more thrilled to, uh, to bring you one of our finest in, in Young Yuma. He is um, our chief investment officer of BMO, uh, BMO Wealth Management in the US, who earned his PhD from the U a few years ago. I might have stolen a little thunder there. Uh, because BMO is new to Utah, I thought I'd give you a little brief uh, introdu introduction and extend an, an invitation to you to uh, get to know us. Uh, in fact, uh, we've got a table out just outside the room that with a bunch of people there, or a couple of people, and that intend to do just that. BMO, uh, which stands for the Bank of Montreal, uh, may, is a 207-year-old bank. Uh, it is based in Canada with a headquarters in Chicago as well in the U.S. It offers services in uh, traditional retail and commercial banking and uh, as well as private banking and, um, uh, and, and all kinds of, uh, of traditional banking services. It is the eighth largest bank in the United or, or in North America with over a trillion in assets. Um, and one, one small note that I like to make is that it has not missed a dividend payment since 1829. Just a day or two. Not a lot of companies can say that. All of this speaks to, uh, to BMO's strength and, uh, and endurance and longevity. BMO is a multinational bank um, with offices around the world. I like to say from London and Paris to, uh, to Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, BMO has grown primarily by acquisition. And uh, as a matter of fact, in, in, in this, just this last year, BMO purchased the Bank of the West. Some of you may uh, may bank there already, and so are now BMO customers. This added significantly to its presence in uh, in the Western U.S., and uh, we're very uh, very happy about that. We have some branches here in Utah, and we're just getting started. So once again, let me invite you to uh, get to know us, come out to our table, and uh, we'd like to know how we can help you with your personal and, and business banking. And oh, if you haven't had an opportunity to uh, put a card in or some information in for our drawing, for a $100 gift certificate to the campus store. Please take some time to do that too. Thank you. You didn't know where I was gonna come from, did you? Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for being here with us. I'd like to extend a special welcome and thanks to our friends from BMO Wealth Management. We're really excited to be hosting this with you today. Um, I'd also just like to say it's a real treat to see so many of our community friends here today. So it's nice to, to get you all involved in, in one of these forums. 
Uh, before we get started with introductions for today's speakers, I'd like to read the University of Utah's land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. And now to introduce today's panel. So as you heard, Young Yu Ma um, earned a PhD in finance here at the Eccles School, and I am proud to say that I taught Young Yu uh, pretty much everything he knows, or at least <laughs> maybe, maybe a small, small portion of what he knows, but I'm still taking credit. Um, he has had an illustrious career ever since. Uh, he's currently the chief investment officer for BMO Wealth Management in the US. Um, he's responsible for guiding strategic and tactical asset allocations for client portfolios. Um, and he leads a team that conducts macroeconomic and market analysis. He's frequently cited in print media, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Barron's, and others. And he's appeared on NPR, CNBC, and Yahoo Finance Television. Um, today, Young Yu joins us for a conversation with our very own Adam Looney, who is our director, uh, the director of the Mariner S. Eccles Institute for Economics and Quantitative Analysis. Adam's also a professor here at the Eccles School, and he's a, a nationally recognized expert on um, a variety of things, but most popularly lately, student loan debt. Young Yu and Adam will walk us through a, 20, a 2024 economic and market outlook focusing I'm jealous of you guys with two of you to hold your notes. Um, focusing on unique considerations in this year of global trans tensions and political choices around the world. The conversation will be moderated by Scott Schaefer, Cuomo Professor and Division Chair, and the John W. McIntyre Family Endowed Chair for Free, e free Market Economics at the Eccles School. So please join me in welcoming Scott, Adam, and Young Yu. Thanks, everyone. We're delighted to be here today. I'm going to fire some questions at our panelists, but I'm also going to leave time for some audience Q&A. And so if you have questions that are unanswered as we go through the program today, then we'll have space at the end. Just raise your hands, and we'd love to hear those. So let's start here. Um, one of the big economic stories of the second half of 2023 was the disconnect between economic fundamentals as measured by unemployment, inflation, et cetera, and consumer sentiment as measured by surveys. We seem to have a sour mood about the economy despite strong fundamentals. And so our question is, why have Americans been so unhappy with the performance of the economy? And I'm gonna toss this to Young Yu to start. Uh, thanks, Scott. And first, let me say it's great to be back here at the U. I've made just a couple trips back since graduating, but I have a lot of mentors here, and it's great to be uh, able to be in front of the crowd here. Um, why has consumer sentiment been somewhat sour despite what's been a favorable year, both in the economy and the stock market? We saw GDP growth uh, for last year come in much higher than people originally expected. The job market held in well. Usually it's the case that when you do have a strong job market, consumer sentiment sort of follows suit, and that's really a, had been historically a pretty tight relationship. But what we saw last year, I think, was driven by a few things. One is that interest rates are higher, that, and people are not quite yet acclimated to that and adjusting to that after more than a decade of very low interest rates. So people going to the car dealership to buy a new car, for example, what they had been used to getting 0% financing or 1.9% financing is now 7.9, 8.9. Uh, much higher rates and things like that, but also housing. I think housing, especially for people that don't own their homes, has been very difficult in terms of some of the rental increases that have taken place over the past couple of years. So I think there are a few factors in place that people are experiencing in their everyday lives, a lot of people, that may be different across uh, different socioeconomic groups and across the spectrum.
but the price levels and some of the interest rate environment is taking some getting used to. So I don't think we're seeing the same sentiment trends, but what's important is not, when we think about the economy, we don't just think about what people say they're feeling, but it's also important to see what they're doing. And what we've seen last year is, uh, by and large, spending still holding up reasonably well. So despite that dour mood that you mentioned, uh, consumer spending has actually been relatively stable and had some modest growth last year. Adam, something to add? Uh, sure. So, so I, I think there's a couple of hypotheses. One is the one that that you just expressed, which is that, you know, the headline numbers um, uh, disguise something like the high cost of housing or high interest rates or you know the price of eggs is just way too high right now, and that's what consumers are focusing on. Um, but I think that if you look at um, first of all, what consumers are purchasing, they're, they seem to be um, flush and um, optimistic about their own purchases. When you ask them as individuals, you know, how is your economic situation? Uh, they report that it is good. Uh, they report that their situation is good and they simultaneously report that everybody else uh, is doing terribly. And so I think that, um, <laughs> I think that, that something has become disconnected between people's attitudes and economic fundamentals. Um, one indication of this is if you look at a recent Brookings study um, by some former colleagues of mine, they look at a, an index of sentiment in newspapers. You know, what are journalists writing about the economy? And, and the journalists, um, uh, and they look at the relationship between the optimism or pessimism in these newspapers and the economic fundamentals, you know, GDP growth and the level of the unemployment rate and inflation. And for you know, decades, that relationship was very tight. So you could explain the sentiment in newspapers by the ups and downs of um, um, macroeconomic fund fundamentals. But since 2018, that, that has um, uh, decoupled uh, and diverged. So now the news that would have caused journalists um, to say the economy is great now causes them to say it's meh. And so um, I think that there's another source of this uh, pessimism that is, that is I, I, you know, pervasive, perhaps caused by journalism or caused by um, social media or something like that that's um, causing us to be more pessimistic than we should be. Very good. Uh, Young, you mentioned interest rates, so let's turn our attention there. A year ago, many economists were worried about recessions and risks to growth, but the economy has remained pretty strong. Um, how much credit do you want to give the Fed? And if you want to assign a letter grade, this is a university. Uh, how much credit do you give the Fed for what so far has been a soft landing? And um, what are your expectations for future Fed policy? And let me start with Adam this time. Uh, okay, well, the, the joke in economics is that economists have, have successfully predicted 10 out of the last five recessions. And, <laughs> and so I think there's just a, a bias of, you know, uh, so what, what's going to go south next year? Um, and I, I will point out that, you know, if you look over history, 16% of the time we're in a recession. And so uh, as a baseline, 16% seems like a, a reasonable estimate. Uh, I'll also say that, um, it's hard to predict recessions uh, in the sense that if you looked in 2006 or in 1999, uh, nobody thought there was about to be a recession. Uh, so, so I think that it's a little bit uh, you know, hard to, to anticipate um, what's gonna happen. But in terms of the, the experience that we've had thus far, uh, I guess I'll point out that, that the US has really had an extraordinary experience uh, in, in global context, the, the issues that have plagued the world economy, um, the supply shocks uh, during the pandemic, the pandemic itself, the war in Ukraine, the, the resulting effects on oil and commodity prices have been worldwide phenomena. Um, uh, and the US has, I think, done much better in the sense that the peak inflation in the United States has been much lower. Um, the rate of GDP growth over this period of time has been much higher. The rate of unemployment in the U.S. is, is lower than our peers, and, and inflation has decelerated more quickly here than elsewhere. Uh, I, I do think that the, the Fed deserves a lot of credit. I'd also say that, um, you know, despite our dysfunctional, apparently dysfunctional political system, we've enacted a lot of useful laws um, on a bipartisan basis uh, that I think has helped um, um, smooth the way for the economy. And I think that also we're just, uh, we've been lucky in, in that we have a particularly resilient, uh, strong, dynamic economy, and, uh, and that has been good for uh, America. 
I'm going to go on a limb and actually give the Fed a grade. So, um, and I'm going to say B minus for right now, and but with room for improvement, right? So, if it, and actually, prior to joining BMO, I was a finance professor uh, for a number of years at university, and you know, I, I think the Fed. Uh, they were a little bit slow to start raising interest rates. They kept interest rates too low for too long, and I, I think did not have the foresight to recognize some of the trends that were starting to build and act quickly when, when those trends did come in place. And I think they probably even went a little bit too far in the very tail end. So I, I would say the Fed has done an okay job. I don't consider it uh, an outstanding job, um, but they are uh, doing a reasonable job to, to uh, bring inflation under control. And But we're not done yet, right? I do think... Uh, how the Fed, uh, the policy the Fed enacts over the next, uh, let's say, six to 12 months will give more of an indication of how well it's kind of navigating some of the waters. Um, but it, they've gotten, they've course corrected. So I think it started off worse than it's finishing up. And there's room to get, I think, that B minus to a, a solid B or maybe a B plus if, if, they, do, if they do this well. So, but I'm very reluctant to give them an A. Uh, at this point. Well, can, can I just ask, so, you know, sometimes we have to grade in the curve. And so, <laughs> like, who is, who is the top of the class? Do you think anybody got it right? Uh, you mean previous feds, or do you mean, no, I mean across I, the spectrum? I mean, across the spectrum uh, in this recent crisis. Has any other country navigated as well as the United States? Well, I think the United States has definitely done well, right? And it, it, it's more a function of the uh, the resiliency of the, the inherent resiliency of the economy and, and the, some of the dynamics are already in place that allowed for more of a buffer in, in the U.S. So I don't necessarily attribute that to the Fed. I think the U.S. economy is very stable. And if you listen to Ben Bernanke, he had a quote that I really uh, thought was insightful not too long ago. He said, uh, the U.S. economy has proven time and time again its resiliency to overcome uh, sort of difficult circumstances because this is a very resilient economy. I don't think uh, the structure of other countries kind of match that, and I think that kind of shows through. It's sort of, I mean, the U.S. economy is sometimes criticized sort of a rough and tumble uh, capitalist system, uh, but the, the benefit of that is it can adjust relatively quickly where other economies have more difficulty doing so. Interesting. Let me try to pin you down a little bit, young you, on expectations about rates. And so as you're looking forward, are we going to see rates coming down? Well, we do think short-term rates can come down. The short-term rates are what essentially the Fed controls. Uh, the longer-term rates are more market-driven. We do think the Fed will start cutting those short-term interest rates probably by May or June is our expectation. Uh, but previously, the market had had these uh, amazingly uh, optimistic or even wishful uh, projections about what it thought the Fed might do and cut rates five or six times this year starting in March. Uh, Chairman Powell came out just yesterday and pushed back against that very strongly and said that the expectation that the Fed would cut rates as soon as March is, is probably misplaced. Um, so that's, that's been our ex base expectation for a while, that the Fed would start cutting rates in the summer. Um, but we don't think long-term rates are going to come down more than they are now. The long-term, the 10-year Treasury yield is around 4% now. It kind of bounces around 4 um, We don't see that coming down much. We see the uh, short-term rates coming down and probably the, the yield curve. So if you're looking across the different maturities, uh, actually flattening out this year and long-term rates perhaps even drifting higher by the end of the year. Interesting. Adam, well, I, can I ask, what, what do you think the forces are behind the, the flattening or the you know, maybe even steepening of the yield curve? Like, well, what's causing long yields to rise or to remain elevated? Uh, in, in terms of uh, where we are now, we, they've come down a lot, right? They've come down from 5% down to, down to around 4%. But what we think by the end of the year is we'll see two dynamics in place. Um, one of those is that we actually expect a bit of growth reacceleration by the end of the year in the U.S. economy, probably a global economy as well. Um, but if, once we see that acceleration, if it's in the third and fourth quarter, we think that's going to give a little bit of a lift to interest rates. In addition to that, uh, just the level of the deficits right now, uh, the funding that is needed for the, to fund the U.S. government deficits just puts a massive supply of treasuries on the market you know, every single month, essentially. And somebody has to buy those treasuries. China's not buying. They're actually selling. China used to be a big buyer of U.S. treasuries. Now they're a net seller. Um, and that had been a big concern last year at one point. That sort of fell off the radar of a concern. But I think when growth reaccelerates in the U.S. and the global economy, that's going to resume uh, as a concern. And not that rates are going to run away the 
to the upside, but we do think there's going to be somewhat of a lift given those two factors coming into play. I mean, as a public finance economist, the the and someone who has been involved in the scoring of of you know federal budgets um, for much of my career, the the budget deficits that that we've been running have been we've known about those for decades, um, and so it's it's always a little bit surprising for me to to be to hear about these market trends that are affecting how these deficits are translating the interest rates. You know, I, I would have thought, uh, or a, a recurring theme in in, uh, in in my field is that, oh man, these deficits are eventually going to lead to higher interest rates, and and that's going to become an increasing problem. But it, but thus far, it has not happened, and so I, I wonder, you know, is now the time finally? And uh, um, it sounds like, to some extent, you, you think it is. Yeah, we've had a big we've had a big change, right? Uh, Pre-pandemic, the U.S. debt was at 23 trillion. Now it's 33 trillion. And if you look at the deficits historically over the past many decades, uh, in typical times they they steadied around three percent of GDP. But right now we're looking at deficits around six percent of GDP structurally. That's if there's no recession, things go well, and that's as far as the eye can see. So we do think these two shifts are very meaningful. We've gone and loaded up the debt tremendously, 50% in just four years, and now we have structural deficits uh, that are double what the structure was uh, of the prior decade. So it is a very meaningful difference than, than prior periods. Taking that line of discussion around deficits, as we look into the future, we see an aging population, we see entitlements becoming more of a problem. Are you anticipating long-term issues with the U.S. economy related to that locked-in entitlement spending? Uh, sure, sir. Um, well, we're positive on the U.S. economy, so I don't like to, to portray things as long-term problems that, that sort of gets us stuck in, in a way we can't get out of. Um, but, but in terms of the, the deficit spending, it is a challenge. The trends uh, uh, are unfavorable, and it doesn't seem like there's an easy way to dig ourselves out of these. There's not the political will to make changes in terms of the environment as it stands now. And the, the problem uh, with deficits growing at 6% of GDP, or, or deficits being at 6% of GDP, means that the debt is going to grow every year. Um, we're, we're not going to get growth, nominal growth that matches that. Uh, and so, you know, what does that mean? It means the problem gets a little bit bigger each year. And, and we, we've ramped up the problem uh, from pre-pandemic to where we are today. Uh, do we think it's, it's something that's crippling for the U.S. economy? No, but we do think if we project out 10, 15 years, it's something that serves as a headwind to growth, that instead of the economy maybe growing at 2.5% GDP per year, it's going to grow at maybe 2 and a quarter. Um, it's going to be a headwind that, that, is, uh, that sort of restrains some of the, the growth potential of the economy. Adam, with your experience in Washington, working in the Treasury and elsewhere, what are your views on are the ability of our politics to resolve some of those problems. Well, there's, there's a quote from Churchill that goes something like, Americans can be relied upon to do the right thing, but only after exhausting all other possibilities. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so, and, and to, you know, to be more optimistic, I, it is striking that we have this view of the of Congress and, and the federal government as being very dysfunctional. Um, but if you look over the last um, several years, they actually have, have produced a lot of um, bipartisan useful legislation, uh, infrastructure bills and, um, you know, the IRA and the CHIPS Act and uh, criminal justice reform. And uh, they've avoided several debt ceiling um, disasters and they've uh, passed budgets. So, you know, they do seem to be getting things done. Uh, I think the the challenge is obviously there are these enormous structural deficits that that are that we've known about for for decades and that are we're in the midst of this widening of those deficits for reasons that are very well understood uh, and are associated with the level of revenues, uh, Social Security, Medicare, health spending more generally. And the the solutions, I think, you know, as a public finance you know technocrat. Um, are anodyne, like everybody knows what levers there are and how they could be pulled. Um, so it really is a political, you know, how and when do we solve these problems? Uh, I, I don't know what will cause the crisis that will um, cause Congress to act, 
Uh, one hypothesis is that you know interest rates are just going to keep rising and rising, and it'll be harder and harder for us to sustain these. And eventually, it will cost so much that Congress will act. Um, that sounds pretty terrible <laughs> uh, as a process. Um, and so I, I do hope that we can solve these things earlier, but I'm not exactly sure what the the mechanism is going to be or the precipitating factor. Very good. Let's get granular for some specific markets here. So, um, you know, one consequence of the high interest rates is uh, housing prices. Uh, very salient for those of us here in Salt Lake City where housing prices have been surging. So what are the prospects for improvement in the housing markets as you look forward? Young Yu? We think there'll be modest improvement this year, but only modest improvement. Uh, we, we see probably the mortgage rates uh, coming down slightly uh, this year, but it, it's probably going to be the case more that this is a strain market for a while, that affordability is very challenged as it is now. Uh, right now, if you look at where the 10-year Treasury yields are versus the mortgage rates, there's a pretty big spread. Historically, it's a much higher than typical spread between 10-year uh, Treasury rates and mortgage rates because of factors going on the mortgage market. We think some of those will soften up a bit this year. So we'll, you know, if 10-year Treasury yields were to stay exactly where they are, I think we'd see uh, lower mortgage rates. Uh, but if those 10-year Treasury yields rise a quarter percent, a half a percent by year end, then we'll probably be right where we are today in terms of mortgage rates because that's probably the, the cushion that you have for mortgage. That spread to come down this year is probably a quarter to a half percent. So what does that mean for affordability? Not, it's not a great environment. We think perhaps it could improve a bit. We'll still get wage growth of around 4% this year. Um, and we think we'll only see very modest depreciation of home prices, but we, we don't see the picture improving much. I mean, it's a very constrained picture in, in housing, especially in the markets where they're seeing a lot of population inflow, uh, like Salt Lake City is, and uh, and other states as well. well. Well, can I can I ask? So, if I bought a house today, you're, you're saying I can't, I'm not going to be able to refinance in two years and and lock in a lower rate. You think it's going to be remain elevated? Uh, you, perhaps in two years you might get a marginally lower rate. I don't think I don't think uh, we're going to get a substantially lower rates, and so. You know, when you when someone actually wants to refinance, is an easy question, but you usually want for a bigger a bigger drawdown in rates. So, we don't expect a big shift uh, in those mortgage rates because we do think uh, one thing that Chairman Powell alluded to last night is a risk of inflation kind of settling above the Fed's two percent target, uh, even though even though you know it's come in below that the last few months in terms of core PCE. We do think there is that risk, and if that's the case. Shorter term rates are going to stay a little bit higher. Longer term rates uh, aren't going to come down as much as people are imagining. I think if we, you know, if we go back historically, where interest rates are now is quite a manageable level. And if you go back to the to the 90s or 2000s, you know, we had interest rates right, you know, higher than where they are today. And and so the the idea that I think a lot of people are still anchored on the experience of the last 10, 12 years when interest rates are rock bottom. I think if we fast forward a few years or five, 10 years from now, we're going to look at the period uh, from 2009 to, 2000, or to 2021 as the anomalous period for interest rates. That's going to be the standout period where interest rates were strangely low, and, and people are going to talk about the factors for that. And what we're actually going to have is more of a reversion to the prior decades where we have interest rates around where they are now is, is our expectation. I mean, that makes for a tough <laughs> housing market. I mean, beyond just the, if you can find a house and, and have to pay 7 or 8%, like, that's hard, obviously. Uh, if you own a home now and you're paying 2.5%, uh, you're never moving out of that home. Uh, so I, I feel like that's going to remain a drag on the supply of kind of existing homes for some time. And then in, in places like Salt Lake City, the, the problem uh, you know, the problem is is very local in the sense that uh, it's a great place to live. A lot of people want to live here. Uh, you know, with the work from home phen phenomenon, there there are many um, you know highly paid coastal elites, so to speak, um, who have a lot of equity in their uh, in their homes who are moving here. And I think that that increases the, their willingness to pay and their the demand for these houses in the city to levels that are astronomical to people who live here, but not astronomical to people who live in San Francisco or DC. 
and then you know more fundamentally we just don't build enough homes in america and especially not in uh in salt lake city and, and adam are you optimistic about state level changes to zoning law that would enhance our ability to build all the homes that americans are demanding uh, i i feel like i'm i'm like totally uh, the things that i think about housing supply in salt lake city i, I think are I don't know. They sound crazy when I say it to people, and so you could test. I, I look at the city, and, and um, so so Salt Lake City is 29% surface parking lot, and it's like, man, how can you not find a place to build a build a building? And yet, um, there's some for some reason we're unable to to infill and and to you know build more than one story tire shops uh, in our downtown. And so I, I'm kind of hopeful that. Uh, we can figure out the formula that allows us to 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 build more and, and to accommodate all the people who want to um, um, live here and, and to keep prices uh, affordable. Great. Well, we're here in the David Eccles School of Business, so let's turn our attention to corporate America. So corporate America has faced some challenges, obviously, over the last few years with the pandemic and the war for talent and challenges with supply chains, uh, but margins have remained strong. Uh, and earnings have repeatedly come in better than expected. So uh, what does 2024 look like for the health of U.S. companies, and how's that going to translate into stock market performance? Young you? Yeah, so for 2024, uh, it's, it's a great question. Our expectation is that we do achieve the soft landing that we've actually been talking about as a firm for about 14 months now, but the first word in soft landing is soft, and that doesn't mean uh, we're going to just go gangbusters from here. Uh, we think the latter stage of the soft landing is we see a, a couple of quarters of moderation uh, in consumer spending, probably corporate spending as well. Um, but we don't think the picture for 2024 is a dire one. We think that we do see stabilization. We think that the uh, labor market remains relatively stable, supports spending, and if, com if people are spending, companies are not going to pull back too much. So we don't expect mass layoffs. We don't expect unemployment to go up to 5% or 6% or something like that. We think spending stays stable, and by the end of the year, uh, once that soft landing is both achieved and the Fed has started to lower rates by mid-year and hopefully continuing to lower rates uh, in the third and fourth quarter, the corporations will then start to, to sort of get into the fray. They've been quite cautious in 2023, and we think some of the corporate spending is going to kick in and provide a bit of a boost to the economy to finish up the year. So we're cautiously optimistic that those trends uh, will... Uh, come into play and that what's at the end of a soft landing or the next stage is actually a bit of reacceleration from the corporate sector. Uh, let's see, let's uh, dig into the investment picture a little bit further. Um, so uh, how, Young Yu, are you thinking about portfolio construction right now? Are there secular themes that you're seeing that have staying power, that are investable? Where should we be thinking about putting dollars right now? Yeah, there are some secular themes. I'll start with a big picture. Um, one of the secular themes I'll, um, I, I do want to get to in a moment is what Adam pointed out in terms of infrastructure. The bills that were passed provide tremendous amount of spending, so I'll touch on that in a moment. But big picture, it sort of fits with that landscape that we talked about this year. Uh, we've been talking about the soft landing, stabilization, maybe by the end of the year, a bit of reacceleration in the corporate sector. You know, how do you want to position portfolios? We think this really portends more of a balanced approach to risk. It's not a year where we expect the markets, equity markets to go gangbusters, probably returns more in line with historical averages, but also a year when you can get reasonable returns from fixed income. And that's not been the case if you, you know, from that period that, that we mentioned, um, from say, you know, 2010 all the way to, uh, you know, pandemic times, you really haven't been able to get a, a return from a, a good return out of fixed income. We think now is the time to to reconsider fixed income for a lot of people who have who have not uh, focused on that in their portfolio. So really, more of a balanced approach to risk. But secular themes, yeah, absolutely. We think infrastructure still has a ways to go. Those bills that Adam talked about that were passed over the past couple of years uh, really have a long runway. Those projects are pulling a lot of investment, and a lot of those projects are just barely getting started or going through permitting even. So those tax credits um, are really incentivizing a lot of companies both to expand in the U.S. and for multinational companies uh, to bring some of their manufacturing to the U.S. So that's the secular theme. We also think 
uh, some of the innovation taking place. Of course, people think about high-tech innovation. There's also a lot of innovation taking place in healthcare, in biotech, in the GLP-1 drugs. Uh, we think those are going to have uh, uh, an impact on the uh, on those sectors in terms of some of the investability and trends that we see uh, for the healthcare and biotech sectors. Very good. Adam, do you want to comment on that? Or maybe do you have more to say about the uh, recent legislation that was passed and the impact that might have on the economy? I mean, so so I think it's uh, we're still waiting to see a lot of, um, as you said, a lot of the the tax credits and incentives for domestic investment are, are still playing out. Uh, I mean, the only on the we're only seeing the leading edge of some of these things, like the the tax credits for cars, for example, that are that are you know, today showing up in people's pockets when they go to the dealership. But I think that a lot of the other you know chips related, the long term infrastructure bills, those will take a long time. All right, so as you may or may not be aware, we're in an election year. Uh, <laughs> and so it's looking to be another tight contest uh, in a sharply divided nation. And so kind of a two-part question here, how is the US economy typically affected by election uncertainty? And are you foreseeing any impact of the campaign on the economy in the run-up uh, to November? Adam, do you want, you, you want to start, Adam? Sure. Well, well, I mean, obviously, it's it is also hard to forecast elections, and and we've seen that in the last several elections. Um, and then I also think it's hard to anticipate the economic consequences of elections. Uh, I think in 20, 2016, obviously, it was one of the was a significant surprise, and and I think, um, um, you know, I think a lot of people thought the stock market was going to go down, and it went up, and uh, uh, and so I think it, it's a little bit hard to know. Uh, I guess I would say also that that you know the like the U.S. economy, the U.S. political system is resilient. Um, we have, uh, you know, two houses in Congress, uh, a president, a Supreme Court, and and those change slowly and and often not all in the same ways. So I think that there is a lot of continuity and uh, to expect, you know, even in an uncertain election year. Yeah, I would echo that. I, I think there is a lot of continuity. I think sometimes it's uh, the the impact of elections can sometimes be. Um, exaggerate on the economy because the economy itself has a lot of resiliency and, uh, and the fundamental structure is, is one that has already been set in place for, for the U.S. But I do think uh, if we think about what took place in, say, the 2016 elections that I mentioned, there was some caution leading up to the election, right? There, the marketplace was a little bit circumspect, not wanting to make any big positioning ahead of that. I think we could see a repeat of that, that uh, the uncertainty is very high. Uh, what might come out of it if things shift one way or another. Uh, you know, there's a fair amount of uncertainty there. And, and probably it could be the case that if we haven't seen much in the way of reacceleration of growth by that time, if it's really just starting to take place, that investors might just prefer to hold off until we see these results and we get a better sense of uh, what the landscape and policy might look like uh, until there are big shifts that take place in the investing landscape. So well, I think there's some caution ahead of it, but the reality is things such as fiscal policy, such as uh, changes to the tax code, uh, probably major changes are not going to happen. So we, we think the impact is probably going to be, in most scenarios, relatively muted. Okay. Very good. Let's get uh, super granular here and think about advice we can give to investors, homeowners, families. What should people be thinking about with regard to those very granular economic decisions as we move into 2024. Young you? Oh, the granular economic decisions, right? This is this is a tough one because I, I think I, I think you know individuals are still in, in the process of uh, adjusting to the higher interest rates. Corporations are still in this process as well. I, I think one thing that we should um, we should perhaps a lot of people should keep in mind, depending on what industry or sector they're in, are some of the uh, adjustments to some of the new technological changes that are underway. Uh, th those can be very impactful, and, and how that impacts certain sectors of the economy uh, can, can really you know, impact the labor force, or layoffs don't happen uh, across the board. They tend to happen in certain sectors at a time. So uh, that can be something people should should focus on. In terms of other granular aspects, I think really you know, we think about investing. For a lot of people, it's worth keeping in mind that the biggest thing to invest in is to invest in yourself, invest in your own knowledge, invest in your own capabilities, um, and invest in your own careers. And I think 
when we talk about investing, we don't want to overlook that, that that is the biggest part of a lot of people's portfolio is your human capital. And, and that's important to reinvest in as well. Adam, thoughts? Most, most of my, uh, most of my clients are 21 years old. So <laughs> I don't, uh, my, man, a lot of human capital being accumulated. That's true. And that's, uh, I think it's still good advice. Uh, I, I don't know that I have a lot of uh, wisdom to impart on on this. I, you know, I tell them to to finish their degree and uh, uh, that they can make avocado toast at home rather than buying it. And uh, you know, they should max out their four hundred one k match. Um, but uh, I don't know that I have new advice for this particular year. Very good. Let's talk quickly about risk factors. So uh, let me start with you, Adam. What do you think risk factors are for the U.S. economy this year? Is there anything that's keeping you awake at night? Uh, what should we be looking for in terms of risks? Well, I, I think it's hard to look at risks. Uh, again, all, all of the recent uh, recessions were were prompted by events that largely were unlooked for: uh, dot com bubble bursting, a financial crisis, you know, a pandemic. Uh, uh, so I, it really is the unknown unknowns, so to speak, that that uh, are the ones to worry about. I mean, there, there are obviously headwinds and things that I, I would worry about from deficits and, and if, if people turn sour on that. Uh, you know, the, the biggest risks today, I, I think, are often uh, geo, geopolitical risks um, that are not in my wheelhouse, so to speak, as an economist, but the things I w would worry about just as a reader of the newspaper, you know, tensions in, in, the, in Ukraine, in the Middle East, uh, with China. Um, so those are the sort of things that I would, I would worry about. Young you? Yeah, I think those geopolitical risks are certainly front and center, and particularly how those may or may not play out in the energy markets. I think fortunately they've not played out in a damaging fashion because, as we know, we're grappling trying to bring inflation down. If we're then fighting against high oil prices, that really uh, would throw that trajectory or could throw that trajectory off course. So I think that's that's a concern. Fortunately, it hasn't played out. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have uh, vast supplies of oil that aren't being pumped right now. And U.S. oil production has actually hit all-time highs uh, last year. So there's some things that are offsetting that, but it's still a risk. Uh, and I think Adam made a very good point. It's the unknown unknowns that, that are concerning because if, if we think about the response to COVID and, the, and how we have, have, have managed that and, and overcome some of that response and government, what the government did do to, to ease that uh, pain, the economic pain that happened, we did actually take... Uh, the debt from 23 trillion to 33, right? I don't think if one of these big unknown unknowns come through and there's a major crisis again, we have the propensity to be able to raise debt 50% again over the next four years. So in a sense, we've kind of shot our shot and that leaves the economy in a little bit more vulnerable state than you'd like it if there is some type of major <coughs> event or crisis that, that uh, unfolds. Um, but that's, that's something that's extreme, you know, impossible to predict. What's somewhat more on the radar, I think we've just seen recently, is I don't think we're done with the banking concerns. And there, there's some news out recently about that. There, there were major write downs at, at one of the New York banks, um, you know, a regional bank in New York. Um, but they're not alone. A lot of areas, uh, the small and regional banks, uh, have uh, uh, extended their portfolios in commercial real estate and office space to a degree that uh, they're likely to incur significant losses uh, as uh, uh, some of these loans come due to be refinanced. So I don't think we're done with that. I don't think it's significant enough to uh, really bring the economy down. But uh, in terms of certain localities, uh, that, that's definitely uh, an area where some places that have been struggling will probably struggle a bit more because the banking sector uh, in weak areas is going to contribute to the weakness. Interesting. All right. We have time for some questions for the audience. And so we've got some people with microphones who will be walking up our aisles. And let's go to the gentleman uh, right here in the back on the left. And please wait till we get a microphone in front of you so that our uh, streaming folks can listen. Could you comment on term limits in Congress and how it could or could not affect the deficit. And is that somewhat of a solution at any point in time? Let me take that to our former Treasury official, Adam. So turbulence in Congress and whether that will impact the debt. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
So I think, um, well, I mean, obviously there are many risks. Uh, you know, one risk is the with the debt ceiling, um, for example, where you know if Congress does not agree uh, to raise the debt ceiling, uh, that can have enormous consequences for um, the financial markets. Uh, on the other on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you know, if you're asking about our long term deficit problem, I mean, Congress surely can can could solve that problem if it could agree on the policies. But those are policies like about raising the level of revenues or um, reducing the growth and benefits of things like Social Security and, and Medicare, which have been very hard to, to make changes. Young Yu, thoughts? How about the, the, the idea of term limits for Congress? Oh, Who's sorry, there? I misheard. Term limits. I, I don't know that I have a good view on term limits. I mean, a, a, every elected pol politician gets, you know, has the opportunity to be um, voted against uh, in their district uh, every two years or every six years. So we sort of have a, a system in place. I do think that, you know, be, a more, <laughs> I would say the problem isn't, isn't um, that they're limited in terms, is that, is that they get to choose their voters. And so that makes it very hard to have um, um, elections that are actually contested. Um, Let's see some more hands. Right down here. Right on the left, right here. Hello. <laughs> okay, I have, a, I have a couple quick questions. Uh, one's more of a short-term concern. One's more of a longer-term concern. I know you've addressed some of these, but I'm going to pitch it in a little bit of a different light. Um, Short-term con concern is I think there's about $500 billion in commercial office space debt that's going to need to be refinanced or dealt with in the next year. You know, I'm wondering, you, you said the regional bank fallout probably won't be a broader economic concern. So I, I just want to hear a little bit more about that. That's a sh more of a short-term concern. I'm wondering if, if that might affect, you know, some other policies like the interest rates and things like that. If they, they have to bail out some of these banks, how that's going to play out. And then secondly, a longer term concern is I just got back from Japan where the yen's at 150 to the US dollar. Their level of debt is about 220% of their overall annual GDP. Whereas the US, we're at 20, about 27 trillion GDP, 34 trillion debt, right? We're about 120%. I'm wondering if 10, 15 years down the road, we may end up in a state like Japan has been in for the last cu couple dec several decades, where they're kind of in this, you know, stagflation, deflationary period, whatever, where it's, you know, I'm wondering if, if that's maybe how it'll play out if we can't sell some of our bonds and we can't afford to pay our interest and they can't change some of these policies. So I'm just wondering how that, how that would compare to Japan. You know, so yeah, sorry, two part, part question there. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll start with the second one okay. because there are definitely some important differences between the debt in Japan and the debt in the U.S. As you mentioned, you're, you're very accurate about the levels. Uh, U.S. debt is about 120% of GDP. If we go back to the 70s, it was around 40%. In the 80s, that creeped up uh, to around 60. Uh, after uh, the financial crisis, we got to 100, and now we're at 120. Um, Japan, however, uh, almost all that debt is owned locally. Uh, so they owed they owe debt to the companies and the, the people of Japan. I think it's around 60% of our debt is purchased internationally. So there, there's a different dynamic in play when you're, the, when you're putting that debt on the market and who the buyers are going to be of that debt and, and if they're gonna show up and at what level they show up. And because ultimately uh, the, the concern is, uh, even though it has not been a concern in the past, you don't ultimately know where supply meets demand when you have unprecedented levels that you're hitting, right? You don't you don't have good good understanding of what happens uh, at those levels because you've never been there before. So how much demand will, will come to meet that that supply that's coming on? Um, so I, I do think that's a challenge and distinction between the U.S. and Japan that that uh, it, it's not necessarily the case that the U.S. has to get to 220 percent debt levels before uh, some potential impacts start arising because of a different dynamic. Uh, I don't think things are going to play out the way they played out in Japan. It had played out over decades, though, so, because the structure of the economy is just much more dynamic in the U.S. And so I, I think we're in a, in a better place in that regard uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that uh, trajectory or that, that baseline that we're starting with. 
Um, the, the question, I guess, that you're building on, on the, the, the topic of commercial real estate, particularly office, is, is weak. Uh, multifamily is also starting to get a little bit weak as well, or we project it to be weak, uh, given all the supply that's coming online in certain areas. Uh, how does that play out? If you look at the big banks, and first of all, it's, it's important to understand how much the, the large banks dwarf the small and regional banks in terms of size. Uh, the large banks, you know, the top 25 banks in the country, have not increased their commercial real estate loan book, the, the proportion of that in, in their portfolios over the past decade or so. It's been pretty stable uh, at, a, at kind of mid, mid to low teens in terms of the overall loan book. So if you take office as a slice of that being maybe a 10% slice, you're talking about 1% of the loan book. I mean, it's, for, for major banks, it's not a big proportion of what's going on. And, and even if you get uh, difficult refinancings, it's very easy to absorb. That's not the case for small regional banks. It's often, uh, for some of these small regional banks, uh, as much as 50% of the loan books. And it's been increasing dramatically over the past decade. Uh, if you take aggregate, gone from about 20, 25% of loan books all the way up to around you know 40% or something like that. So it's a very different problem for small regional banks, but it is important if, if you think about the banking sector as a whole, I mean, you could argue that, you know, I work for a bank, of course, um, uh, but you could argue that the U.S. is overbanked uh, in terms of having too many small regional banks. Uh, I, I think there will be some consolidation there. I think that's ripe for taking place. It probably makes sense uh, economically for that to happen as well. And this could be an impetus uh, for some of that to take place. But I don't think the problem is large enough uh, to sort of uh, bring the system down because the stability lies in the big banks uh, that, are, that are quite stable. Very good. Let's see some more hands. Let's go over to this gentleman and let's pass the mic in. Very good. Thank you. Um, just kind of curious. So the bank term funding program offered by the Fed kind of as the fallout from last year's banking crisis comes to an end in March. Kind of curious on a perspective, you know, timeline wise, do we see regionals and so-and-sos going in and taking on more debt before that program turns off? May the Fed even extend that program if certain regional issues continue? I'm just curious on a perspective there. I, I'd be surprised if they don't extend that program. Um, I, don't, I don't see a reason not to extend that program and the details of, of that program. Essentially, the, the banks are allowed to put as collateral um, the, the treasury securities and, and uh, I think even mortgage holdings that they hold um, that are on a mark-to-market -market basis underwater, but they can borrow against that at par, at par value. And that, that allows for their portfolio uh, of assets, which is uh, on a mark-to-market -market basis facing a lot of strains, uh, essentially providing them liquidity um, to be able to kind of ride this out and, and sort of see these uh, see these securities kind of go to maturity and, and wait for that, uh, you know, multi-years to play out. Um, I, I do expect that will be extended. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be. Um, and I don't think the, the banking sector strains are over so that it, it makes every, every sense that the Fed would do that. Let's go. We have a question from our online contingent. Let's go to Francis in the back. Francis is monitoring the chat from the stream. That's where this question is coming from. Yes, from our live stream audience, we have a question about AI. So artificial intelligence is high on everyone's radar, even though the technology is not necessarily new. What implications does it have near, intermediate, and long-term for businesses and investors? Let's start with Adam on that, and then we'll go to Young Yu. What are the implications? Well, well, I, as a general, as a general technology, I mean, AI has the potential to in, increase productivity and and to you know dramatically reshape the the types of work that people do. Uh, I, I don't think we have a, a good sense of where all the impacts of that will be. Uh, in the past, you know. You know, general technologies like this have have you know, quietly had a revolution in terms of uh, um, you know how, how we do our work and and where we do our work and how how it goes on. Uh, but I don't think I have specific um, observations about you know, for example, sectors or uh, how it will uh, affect 
uh, particular jobs or industries. Thoughts, Young Yu? Yeah, I think the, the comment Adam made about productivity is spot on. Definitely a lot of potential increased productivity in that in aggregate increases the growth of, of, the, uh, of the United States and of the global economy. Now, the, the challenge, of course, is going to be that increasing growth is not uniform and that there are going to be some areas that grow significantly and that they realize those productivity gains can do more with less investment. Uh, but there are going to be areas that are, that are disrupted as well. I think there are going to be uh, certain job uh, sectors that are that are that don't see have the prospects that they once did. I mean, it's sort of the natural evolution when you have a new technology uh, that there there are winners and losers, and even areas such as computer programming, which used to be sort of a, a foundational aspect. If you listen to Sam Altman, uh, who's a founder of ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT's company. Um, the one thing he says is that what's going to get better and better for sure is the ability of AI to to do programming just based on prompts. It's already being used uh, quite extensively by programmers, uh, but that functionality is going to get better and better. So, you know, there, it's going to adjust where the, where the opportunities are, I think, and it's going to disrupt a lot of a, a, a lot of different uh, parts of the economy that were somewhat perhaps um, knowledge based but somewhat repetitive. I think those are, are probably the types of uh, jobs that might be at risk. I'm going to ask a follow-up on that. Um, do you see AI leading to increased wealth inequality in the United States, or do you think this could be a force that finally begins to reduce the wealth inequality that we've seen since the 1970s? Uh, my own personal opinion is it will probably increase the, the wealth inequality, that uh, this technological development, some people really benefit from this and, and really see gains to this. If, if you get a lot of productivity improvement, that increases profitability, uh, you know, in, increases the capacity uh, to accomplish things. But I think the, the benefits of that are probably going to not accrue across the board. They're going to probably accrue to, uh, you know, maybe across the board in terms of companies, but in terms of the individuals are actually benefiting from this. I think it's going to increase inequality a bit. That you know, you can see some people really uh, thriving off of this, but but others, um, you know, sort of some of the hollowing out of some of the knowledge-based jobs that were considered to be stable, uh, no longer being stable. So, uh, the, the story of inequality over the last. 40 years has, won, has been one in part of uh, what we call skill bias technological change. So the, the phenomenon is basically that uh, better educated workers, um, you know, were complements with technological changes. So they use those technologies to expand what they could do. Um, you know, to, the example is something like you used to um, used to have to have uh, a secretary or staff uh, help you write letters and take your notes, and, and now you do it all in email. Uh, and so you've kind of economized, and, and the, the highly educated person is, is now able to capture more of the, the labor income from that. Um, and so I, I think the question is, you know, how much of AI is going to substitute for high skill? Uh, you know, it might be that it, it, it dilutes the earning power of lawyers and doctors or, uh, you know, substitutes for their work rather than as a complement. But, but I don't really know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think in my case thus far, uh, it's been a huge productivity enhancement for me just because I can use the programming skills and the, um, you know, it speeds what I write. It can describe what's in table five much faster than I could do myself. Um, and so I think it's it's been a boon in that way. But uh, I don't know what it's going to be like in the long run once it really rolls out and um, becomes more pervasive. Yeah, it is a massively open question and is just an extremely hot topic for researchers, people who study the labor market right now. I do think there's reason to believe that we could get some resolution from wage inequality. It seems like AI often brings people who are medium good at tasks up to being quite good and improves people who are already good at those tasks only modestly. And so it's an open question, I think, as to the impact of AI, uh, which is a good segue into the next alumni panel. So we're going to wrap up this discussion. I'm going to turn things back over to Mark and Stephanie for some concluding remarks. Thank you again. 
that question is a great segue into our topic for our next alumni or Eccles alumni forum. Join us on Thursday, April 18th from 1215 to 115 to discuss the AI evolution, the past, present, and future of AI in our lives. Our panel will include Aaron Davis, customer engineer for AI and ML at Google, Derek Egan, head of product for Google Cloud Development AI, and Matt McBride, corporate VP and CFO for Microsoft. Registration is open at the QR code where you can visit eccles.link slash AI forum. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's forum. Scan this QR code or visit eccles.link forward slash forum feedback. And please take a few minutes to let us know about today's topic and any topics you'd like the Eccles Alumni Forum to discuss in the future. I'd like now to bring Michael Poulter back to the stage for a raffle drawing. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm gonna have Catherine draw. Okay, this one too. Uh, the winner is Kent Bowman. Kent, would you raise your hand? Over here, okay. And congratulations again to our winner. Um, thank you, Michael and BMO, and a special thank you to Young Yu, Adam, and Scott. If you'd like to hear more from Young Yu Ma, tune in to the Eccles Business Buzz podcast at eccles.link forward slash business buzz or wherever you download your podcasts. New episodes drop every Thursday. And finally, for those of you who are here present in the auditorium, uh, lunch is available outside.